All right, we've got Canada in the house. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see what we got, because Detroit, Quebec, Atlanta, New York, Eatontown, New Jersey. That's your neck of the woods. Right down the street. Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico. I remembered. <laughs> Newfoundland. All over the states. It's awesome. I don't know what the time zone is for this in Europe. They're probably like 3 a.m. or something. <laughs> All righty. So uh, it looks like a bunch of you figured out how to get on, and that is amazing. Uh, somebody said, hi, Dr. Pope. Might be one of your clients or someone who knows you. So... Uh, Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Judy Morgan. For those of you who haven't met me because we did have some new people sign up for this that have not been following us for a long period of time. And uh, this is the beginning of our Natural Pet Care Summit that will go all weekend. I believe we have eight interviews. So one tonight, four tomorrow and three on Sunday. It'll be a very busy weekend for us. Uh, but we got a headliner for tonight for you. Uh, this is Dr. Kendra Pope. And um, it's so funny because we have practiced within anywhere from a few miles to, you know, 60 miles away from each other for uh, quite a few years, but have ac never actually met in person. And we've shared a lot of clients. Um, and I'm really happy because she's still in New Jersey and she is an integrated practitioner which means she does some traditional stuff and some, um, I hate to call it alternative. So yeah. not traditional Western medicine, uh, so something other than Western medicine. Um, but she's also a board certified oncologist and that makes her really special because there are very, very few board certified oncologists who also practice alternative or other therapies outside of traditional oncology. Um, and interestingly, um, Kendra, I ha had this, this little dog sitting behind me, actually that's her cuddle clone, Myra, mm -hmm. had lymphosarcoma in her small intestine and it ended up being a true nightmare. Um, but uh, we took her to oncology over at Hope mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania and the oncologist that we got, unbeknownst to me, just happened to be trained in TCVM. Oh yeah. So it was, it was, it was a good mix for me because, and she hadn't done food therapy yet. So she was really excited to talk to me about food and uh, she had done more herbal stuff than me. So it was a, it was a good mix and I, it made me feel more comfortable. So um, I, I have a ton of questions and then we'll, any, any information you want to give our listeners um, about, I, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, things they can do for prevention, some of the different cancers that we're seeing and some of the newer therapies and, and things that are out there. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> how did you put those two together? What, <laughs> what made you want to do the, those two things kind of combined? Yeah, I, I, um, <clears throat> I remember having the conversation with, um, another specialist once and they were like, what is wrong with you? Like, why would you spend all this time specializing in this one thing? And then, you know, spend all this other time specializing more in this other direction. Um, and thanks for having me, Judy. This is so fun. Um, even when I was just starting with my acupuncture training. I remember one of my mom's coworkers, she had brought her dogs to like way back in the day. She has Aussies that were like performance dogs and I, she used you for acupuncture and herbs. And she told me like way back in the day, you need to meet Dr. Morgan and <laughs> she is the best. And you know, so it's funny, like even way back when I was starting, I obviously knew all about you. Um, so thank you and um, I'm happy to be here and have your audience to, share with. So um, I'm excited about that. So I guess <clears throat> I had a personal experience, not myself, but a family member that I lost to cancer. And so I knew very early in my veterinary career that that was the kind of niche that I wanted to make a difference in. But I went to the University of Florida. And so I was exposed to Chinese medicine very closely. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. You know, Dr. Shea is just amazing. And as a student, you get acupuncture rotations and herbal training and you just it's part of your general cur curriculum awesome. and it just became very obvious to me very fast that 
the two combine so beautifully for quality of life, because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. You know, if you're treating cancer, regardless if you're treating an animal or a person, the priority should be quality of life always, always. Yes. And it's not in human oncology. And I watched that and um, that was devastating to me. And I knew that it needed to be different. Um, and I just knew that that was kind of where it needed to marry together and blend. And so um, what I've realized is that um, even when your primary goal is quality of life, oftentimes you can get quantity also. And so that's nice side effect. <laughs> exactly. That's been a really amazing and beautiful side effect um, that I've learned more and more about. I, I used to think in the beginning that all I could do was make them feel better. And then I realized I could make them live longer too. <laughs> and then that was really cool. Um, so I, I I'm sure you have a very similar story. Most of us in the integrative world, our specialty kind of finds us. We don't yeah. find it. You know, it's our purpose. It's like what we're meant to do. So I feel really fortunate that I found it as early as I did. Yeah. I, you know, I, I personally, I think that any student who has the opportunity to go to veterinary college in Florida should take that opportunity because once you meet Dr. Shea and you see his success stories and you see him work, he's an artist, his, his acupuncture, his, his, his diagnostics, he's an artist. And when I first met him, I said, I just want to climb inside his brain for yeah. just 10 minutes and take a little tour. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He just watching him. It's called for anybody um, who obviously doesn't know acupuncture. It's called a body scan where he takes an empty acupuncture cap and he goes over all of the meridians on a horse and he's looking for trigger points that he's picking up on where there's sensitivities and irregularities. And then that's how he's going to know what to do and watching him do that and then pick like three or four spots to put needles in a horse and a horse goes from completely lame to sound in like five minutes. It's literally like magic. It's just the coolest thing. It really is. It really yeah. is. And I used to do a lot of horse work and I gave it up because I was just so busy. I didn't have time to do the farm calls and horses are probably the most rewarding animal to work on because they literally will just fall asleep and, you know, <laughs> they're, they're like limp. They, they just, they really love it. So, um, you know, your practice is a small animal practice, correct? Yeah. You treat, you treat, uh, dogs and cats only, or have you done anything more exotic? I've had some random um, things that people have asked me to help with. Um, like we had a iguana that was in kidney failure and then like um, a pig that had arthritis and um, uh, ferrets that had insulinomas and um, rabbits with inner ear infections. <laughs> so Very like cool. once in a while, you know, we get random things, but yeah, mostly dogs, a lot of dogs, and then probably a third of cats, you know, cause okay. we don't see them as often, but yeah. And I, I actually didn't realize it until I looked at your website that you do preventative medicine and other things other than just oncology, which uh, tonight we're going to focus more on oncology, but we're going to pick up a couple of other things along the way with that. Do you see with your, uh, I mean, clearly in veterinary practice, we see more dogs than cats because cats are pretty good at hiding when they're sick and uh, people really don't like to shove the 18 claws into a box with all the teeth and get it there. It, you know, cats, cats stay home more. Are you, we're seeing a huge increase in the number of cancers in dogs. Statistically, it's something like 1.6 out of every two dogs over age 10 are going to have a cancer diagnosis of some sort. It may not be what kills them, but they're going to have that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, are we seeing the same thing in cats? Yeah, so the data is really old. There hasn't been a lot of new epidemiologic studies. The most recent one I put together a presentation was still from the 80s and it was one in three. So that's a similar amount to actually humans to get cancer. So one in three women, one in three men, one in three cats, um, and then one in two dogs over the age of 10. Um, so I imagine that it probably is higher than that. We just haven't done the studies. So it's right on trend with people, which is um, scary. It is. Well, <clears throat> we live in sort of a toxic environment and mm -hmm. uh, we have the same problems with people that we do with yeah. dogs uh, and cats. Uh, we have environmental pollution. We have chemicals that are in our soil that are leaching into our foods. We have you know, Roundup. We have um, all the horrible chemicals that we're using as pesticides on and in our animals. 
uh, over vaccination people and animals. Uh, so I, I think it's not a shock that the two trend together. Um, what would you say are the most common cancers? We'll do dogs separately from cats. What are the top two or three that you are seeing in practice? I think they still are on par with what the statistics say. For dogs, it's lymphoma is the most common. That still is very common. Mast cell tumors is another very common one. I think that I've seen a lot of them, especially with the chronic itchy skin dogs and the pitties with the recurrent you know, cut them off, more come back, cut them off, more come back. Um, and then it used to be that um, osteosarcoma and hemangiosarcoma were kind of interchangeable for the top three. Um, I would say I don't feel like I am seeing as much osteo as maybe I did in my residency. And I don't know if that's a function of people coming to seek my treatment, but I see a ton of hemangio and like really bad hemangio. Like by the time it's found, it's already really aggressive. So I would say, um, um, definitely mast cell tumors, hemangio, and then definitely lymphoma. Okay. For the dogs. And what about for the kitties? For the cats, lymphoma, for sure. Definitely seeing that all the time. Um, yes, most common is the GI tract, but then we can see it in their kidneys. We can see it. Um, sometimes they will get it in their lymph nodes. Um, um, those are the most common locations usually for the cats. Um, what else do we see a lot of in kitties? They can get skin tumors, and I, I do see you know a fair amount of those. Unfortunately, the oral squamous cell carcinomas is something That's... that is fairly common. Yeah. Um, and then <clears throat> I would say I see a lot of mammary carcinoma. A really? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's talk about that for a minute because there's this huge debate going on. When do we spay? Do we spay early? Do we spay late? Um, are you seeing the mammary adenocarcinomas more in the dogs that are left in Well, and I should first of all clarify, is that dogs or cats or both? And are they older unspayed females? Yeah, so these are the cats that I feel like I see them most often in. Yeah. And again, it could be a function of like, they don't wanna pursue chemo and surgery, so they come to see me and maybe that's skewing it a little bit. But um, cats specifically are really good models, translational models of triple negative breast cancer in women. So because most of these, patients are spayed early because, you know, most people that have cats are not going to leave them intact, especially a female. And so their, their, um, genitourinary cancers are generally hormone receptor negative. So for example, if a woman or a man gets, um, a breast cancer or an ovarian cancer or prostate cancer, um, their, their cancers are have a higher likelihood of being hormone receptor positive, which tend to be less aggressive. So that's why when you hear like, for example, a woman who gets diagnosed with breast cancer, she'll go and she'll get special testing done and they'll say, um, if it's triple negative, that's bad. That means that all of the hormone receptors are negative. That is most common in animals and definitely cats because they have had their hormones removed very early. So cats tend to serve as a really good model of this tri triple negative breast cancer, which is very, very aggressive. Right. And so um, generally speaking, when cats have breast cancer, which obviously, you know, Judy, we recommend very aggressive surgery that removes everything because their lymphatic systems and their blood vessels are very highly communicative and the cancer cells can just spread everywhere. So um, these guys are spayed early um, and they're not necessarily super old kitties. I would say nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. Um, and I would say that that's frankly the same for a lot of cancers. You know, unfortunately we don't see kitty cats like 15, 20, you know, years anymore. They get cancer a lot earlier. Yeah. I just, I lost my last kitty at 21 to lung cancer, found it accidentally at 19, wow. took an x-ray and went, oh, you have a goose egg in your chest. Okay. Yeah. You're 19. We'll see what happens. And she lived to 21, uh, did well. And I had a 17 year old cocker who also had lung cancer. I diagnosed them both at the same time. Yeah. Um, and the, the dog didn't last as long as the cat, but she did huh. well. And you know, when they're, when they're 17 and 19 and 20, you go, 
you had a good life. I'm really not going to yeah. torture you with a whole lot. Uh, so they did uh, great. All right. So we have a question. What are the signs of mammary cancer in cats versus dogs? Oh, um, they're the same. Um, it's a palpable mass. Um, the good news about um, our companion animals is that their breast tissue is external enough that you don't need, you know, special imaging like a mammogram to be able to find their tumors. It's all very external. Um, it can be a little bit difficult in cats because they generally don't like to lay on their back and have their belly rubs like dogs do. So it can actually be a lot harder. And a lot of times owners never even see the breast tumor until maybe it's gotten so large that it's started to become uncomfortable and the cat is over grooming it or it's ulcerated or it's bleeding or it's infected. Um, so <clears throat> if at all possible, um, when your kitty is kind of curled up or interested in being pet or getting brushed, um, it's ideal. And I always do this when I do a physical exam, you really want to try to find every uh, mammary gland and feel around there for a hard lump. Um, unfortunately in cats, if there is a hard mass, most of the time it is a malignant tumor. In dogs, it's actually uh, much less likely to be malignant. It's a 50-50 chance that it's completely benign. Um, but the most common sign of both of them is that it's a firm mass associated with a mammary gland. Right. So, uh, and what I found is that in kitty cats, they tend to be further forward and be more malignant. Whereas with the dogs, the further back they were. Is oh, that's interesting. I, yeah. I mean, I wonder if there would be any <clears throat> correlation to positioning other than like where the lymph nodes drain to. That's interesting. Yeah. So there's a fun study for you to undertake. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's just from 37 years of taking off tumors and which ones come back aggressive. Yeah. The, the most caudal mammary gland in the dog seemed to be the most aggressive in my, in my so I could take off a, an adenocarcinoma in a, a middle gland or a more anterior gland on a dog and it would come back as a positive cancer and we'd kind of do nothing other than some herbal therapy or whatever. And, and even some of my caudal gland ones, we didn't do chemo or radiation or anything and the dogs did fine um kitty cats do not respond nearly as well but i did find that the the more caudal they were in the dogs the more aggressive they seem to to behave and it may just it may be total yeah just Who something knows? that struck me and may not be real um so we'll see uh somebody asked if if we could um talk real quickly about the the space studies i mean i've i've written many blogs on the space studies the early spay neuter uh as far as uh, i'm sorry delaying spay neuter as far as cancer prevention yeah. in your practice if someone came to you uh with cats we, we tend to want to spay and neuter earlier with them but for, if somebody came to you with uh, a puppy and said hey when should i spay and neuter what are you telling people right now? Because it's every holistic vet I ask has a different answer. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And I think that probably part of the reason is because the answer is so specific for every pet owner too, you know, because we obviously as veterinarians are trying to do the best for the pet in front of us, for the pet population in general. <laughs> um, you know, so I feel like there's so many things to take into consideration. When so we'll, we'll give it the caveat of this is a responsible pet owner who is not going to let their pet run loose <laughs> and get bread. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So that's perfect. So we can take that out of there. So um, there are well-published studies that all oncologists will cite. So I always get them out of the way first. So we know that dogs that go into heat, every heat cycle they go into, um, that the, the spay is delayed, they have a higher risk of getting mammary tumors. That is a well-known study that is established. Um, I then explained to the owners that um, although that is true, um, dogs that develop mammary tumors have a 50-50 chance of them being benign or, malig or malignant, and that generally speaking, the malignancy correlates with size. So the earlier you get it off and the smaller it is, the more likely, this isn't a guarantee, but the more likely it is to be benign. So that at least is something that can be slightly circumvented. Um, we also have a study that shows um, in prostate tumors that um, they, they believe that um, neutering early may be slightly protective. Um, 
testicular tumors are obviously completely prevented if they're castrated. I explained to owners that generally speaking, testicular tumors are usually locally invasive, generally benign. They're completely external, so you can feel them um, and you can know when there's a problem. And if there is a problem, then you castrate them and generally it's taken care of. Um, what I then have a conversation with them about is that there are studies that are coming out more and more that <clears throat> have concerns about more aggressive cancers like osteosarcoma, hemangiosarcoma, and higher risks of these very aggressive cancers in early spays and neuters. And in those instances, those may be the higher risk than the other ones. Um, so what I will usually say to owners is that if they're responsible and they're willing to deal with an intact animal, that I usually wait for them to at least be full grown. If it's a large breed dog, that's probably somewhere between 18 to 24 months. Um, and if they're comfortable having an intact female for longer, usually until they're eight or nine years old, and then potentially to spay them to prevent a pyometra. Um, for the dogs, as long as they're non-aggressive, as long as they're not marking and causing trouble, then usually keep them intact. Um, I, I feel like there's probably a lot more that we don't know because we're not looking to do it and we're not looking for those studies. Um, so if I have a super responsible pet parent, I will err towards the side of waiting longer. Yeah, that's pretty much where I, you know, by, by the last 10 years, it was, we're going to wait longer and longer and longer and longer. Um, and I was seeing, even though they say that early spay neuter doing these eight week old puppies doesn't cause problems, it causes problems. <laughs> yeah. There was a really interesting, um, which conference was this? You might've been one of the speaker at one of them. I'm trying to remember which one it was, but they were talking about the consequences of spaying and neutering. And they were talking about how it was all related to the luteinizing hormone receptor and about how they found that basically all tissue in the entire body had these receptors. And when you spay or neuter early, that then you have all these receptors that are looking for these hormones and none of them are getting stimulated by the hormone. And so then there's all of these metabolic changes that are occurring in all of the body systems. So um, yeah, it's just, it's very interesting. And I, I very much think that there's a lot that we don't know yet. Yeah, I agree. And uh, on that particular thing, uh, I'm working on, um, it's bigger than a white paper, smaller than a real whole book uh, on Cushing's. And oh, mm -hmm. that was one of the studies that, uh, yeah, you know, talking about yeah. early spay neuter and we're getting yeah. so much more Cushing's disease. And that's yeah. one of the things that was cited that we are changing uh, the, those hormone receptors. And so the adrenal glands are like, well, you took away the thing that produced all those hormones. So we're just going to go a little crazy and we're going to do that. Um, that's another topic. Um, okay. So mast cell tumors, the new injection that's out. So my daughter's dog, Gwen, or my daughter Gwen's dog, Mila, uh, <laughs> she's like a Rhodesian mix thing, coon hound, something, I don't know, big 80 pounds, uh, cute dog, middle-aged had a lump on her tail about a third of the way down this long whip of a tail. And um, so of course, after I retired and moved down here, she said, hey, what should I do with this? And she got aspirated, it's a mast cell tumor. Uh, and so they decided that they would amputate the tail because it was far enough down on the tail that they could just make her look more like a boxer now. Um, <laughs> So I, you know, I, I have my little herbal protocol that yeah. has been very herbal and diet protocol. that has been very successful for me in practice for mast cell tumors. And I'm sure you add even more onto it. Um, and I said to Gwen, well, we could just do that and sit because it's very quiet and it's pretty low on the tail. Um, and she said, well, I think I'm going to go ahead and have the tail amputated. Okay. Great. No problem. Because maybe we can solve the problem. But in my research, I happened to pick up one of my journals and there's this new injection for mast cell tumors and it says it can only be used like below the hocks or below the elbows or something and I thought well the tail is kind of an appendage that's yeah. <laughs> low down uh, but the oncologist didn't recommend it are you using that injection do you like it does it work <laughs> you know what's so funny is that this injection was a similar experience to like do you remember the um the lymphoma vaccine 
that was out like a little while ago. There was this lymphoma vaccine that was launched mostly to like the primary care veterinarians and the oncologists didn't know anything about it. And then like we were getting phone calls and they were saying like, oh, what do you think about this lymphoma vaccine? We're like, what are you talking about? And then um, this is something similar. Like there was a, um, on the listserv maybe two months ago, someone was like, hey, has anybody heard of this? I have a client who's asking about it. And then there was nothing like, no marketing, no papers sent to us for like review of anything. And then I got the same thing. I got like my, my, um, you know, annual magazine or whatever. And I was like, it was, it was on the front of the JAVMA. It was on the front of the paper. I know. And I still haven't read any paper about it. So yeah, I do know that, um, there are some doctors using it. My understanding is that it's for non-resectable tumors. Um, so, but, but frankly, I don't know as, I don't know enough about it because I haven't seen the scientific research about it, but no, most oncologists aren't. Um, I would still say for mast cell tumors, um, surgery is always the first recommended option when possible. The, now these are all the conventional recommendations. Surgery is always the first, you know, option when possible. Um, you know, depending if you can get it all or not, that's when then you talk about chemo or radiation therapy, you can inject it with steroids, you know, that is something that people do. And then this, I, my understanding is to be for tumors that cannot be surgically resected, but I'm not even sure about its mechanism of action. So I haven't used it yet. Okay. Have you ever used Buck Mountain's neoplasing on tumors? I haven't. I know about it. It scares the living bejesus out of me. So I have it, but have you, did, did it like, did the mast cells like blow up when you injected uh, them? I don't, you know, so I used it on a lot of tumors and sometimes I used it on tumors that I didn't have a diagnosis of what the tumor was. Uh -huh. So that's, it's kind of interesting. And it, if you have a tumor that's a little bit ulcerated, it works really well. Uh, if you have a tumor that has not broken through, then you have to inject into it, which is, I had a dog had an anaphylactic reaction to and collapsed a, a, a oh, wow. tail or something, a big golden retriever. And I kind of went, oh, so that scared me off the injectable. Uh, but the topical, and I got started with neoplasia and it was the most interesting story. I had this older middle-sized dog who had a big ulcerated mammary tumor right in the middle of its belly. And uh, the dog was not a good surgical candidate, but I hadn't used the neoplasing. I had it, but I hadn't used it. And I said, I, I convinced the owners, I said, we're going to go to surgery. We're going to try to get this thing off of there. Well, we put the dog under anesthesia, flipped her up on her back. She turned blue, had an arrhythmia. And I said, we're waking that dog up. We already had the area prepped. I threw ne neoplasing on it, put a bandage around it. And 10 days later, the tumor fell off in my hand. Perfect. No scar tissue no big open wound, um, was the most, I was hooked. And so I used it, you know, on ear, little ear things on toes. Yeah. Uh, I had a spindle cell sarcoma on a Dalmatian. It was, uh, that kept ulcerating inside the hind leg. Mm. And you know how spindle cells are. They just, they they just spread along the muscle. And so I was putting the neoplasing on it and it would make so much necrotic tissue and we would just scrape it off. Uh, we did that for about a year and a half. The owner was doing a lot of oh. bandage changes because it's kind of gooey, yeah. but you know, it was not a removable tumor and she didn't want to take the leg off and it worked really well for about a year and a half or so. And then finally the, the dog had a big, a big, uh, like a necrotic lipoma and the dog fell down and it popped. Uh, and she said, okay, it's time to take the leg off. So the leg went, but the, the dog got a couple of years. Uh, so I, I like neoplasing for the right tumors. Yeah. I had a, so somebody asked on here, can lipomas turn to cancer? Um, and interestingly, I had a Labrador retriever who was hit by a car mm. went early in life mm -hmm. and uh, banged up its shoulder. The dog developed a liposarcoma. So a cancerous lipoma. They're, they're rare. They're, they're very small percentage, but you know, there was an area of trauma and it was up under the shoulder blade. So it was not removable. And, uh, kind of the same, your spelling is very close there. Kim Winkler. It's with an E N E. Um, it's made by Buck mountain. Um, the dog de fell on it kind of like this other dog and it had a necrotic center, um, which meant the center of the tumor was dead because the tumor had gotten so big, there wasn't enough blood supply to it. 
So we had this draining tract under the armpit. I said, I got nothing to lose. I shot the neoplasin up in there. Within a week, the entire tumor sh shredded out of there, never came back. Dog was not lame. People thought I was like the best thing ever. And I was like, well, I got really lucky. Uh, so I don't count neoplasing out. It uh, can be quite amazing. And um, the guy who started Buck Mountain and started with all that, I think his name is Randy, he has since passed. Uh, but he does have some really interesting case studies um, on the website. Uh, a lot of people have used it and they say yeah. very similar things, you know, like it's just very fascinating what it does. I used it on myself. <laughs> I thought I had a, um, uh, a skin melanoma on my thigh. And so I said, well, well, I don't have anything to lose. I'll put it on there. Oh my God, it ate a hole in my thigh. I went, okay, then. <laughs> Didn't make my dermatologist very happy though. <laughs> I went to him after the fact and said, can you tell me if this is a cancer? And he's like, there's a hole in your leg. Yeah. <laughs> what am I supposed to tell what am, you? I, what am I supposed to be biopsying? <laughs> I said, okay, I already fixed it. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, it's good. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So mast cell tumor, we haven't done that injection. So you talked a little bit about this, you know, sketchy lymphoma vaccine that kind of existed yeah. and didn't. Uh, there is a melanoma vaccine. Yeah. Um, so are, are there many vaccines out there? Like I've heard of sort of making autologist vaccines and those sort of things. Are there a lot of vaccines out there and are there vaccines kind of in the works or things that you've heard of or that are already there that are either cancer preventatives or cancer therapies where we're getting good results with a vaccine? Yeah, the melanoma vaccine is the only... Um, consistently studied and uh, researched vaccine that's very commonly used. There's also variations on the commercially available one from Marielle for melanoma. Um, the University of Florida has their own that they use. They use it a lot in their horses down there because obviously there's lots of sun. So the horses get it from the sun. Um, I think the um, University of um, Wisconsin has their own also that they use. Um, and that vaccine does seem to be effective, but it seems to be effective in a very small subset of canine melanoma patients. And they are believed to be the ones that have achieved what's called local control. So either their tumors are completely surgically excised um, or they haven't been completely surgically excised, but they've been controlled with radiation therapy. Um, there's been a lot of follow-up studies that show in patients that <clears throat> don't fit that subset, it probably doesn't make a big difference. The good part about the vaccine is that there's essentially no side effects. Um, the bad part is that it's very, very expensive, depending on, you know, whether it's private practice or academia that you're getting the vaccine in, it's probably anywhere between four to $800 a vaccine. And it's a series of four. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very expensive. Is it's the vaccine ever used by itself as a therapy or is it generally in combination with chemo or radiation or surgery or whatever? It's completely labeled for a situation of where there's been local control achieved. So surgery at a minimum or surgery or radiation to control the local tumor. Now that being said, oncologists, and there are published studies to show that there may be some benefit of using it once there is metastasis or spread. Um, so I do know oncologists that even if there's spread of the melanoma, they will continue to give the vaccine because there may be some minor benefit. Um, so but it's not meant to be used in what's called the bulky disease set settings when there's a large tumor in the mouth. Uh, we don't think that it works that way because it is immunotherapy. So really what you're doing is you're just having the immune system help to control the tumor. Um, and so it does that better when it's microscopic, not a large bulky tumor. Sure. Um, as far as other vaccines, there are a lot of projects going on. There is a fair amount of research. Um, there's definitely companies trying to take advantage of people. Um, so there's a lot of things out there where you can send in pieces of tumors and get vaccines created for you. Um, 
There's also vaccines that they're just looking at safety trials. So there was the osteosarcoma vaccine that we thought was going to be like so exciting out of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, somewhere along the way, licensure got changed and then the original vaccine didn't go to market. It was a different one that went to market. Um, so I don't even know when that vaccine is going to be available. Um, the original trial and the original dogs in that osteosarcoma trial did amazingly well. And so so um, hopefully we will see that vaccine soon. Um, but so would that, that again be one of those where it's you've taken the leg off if possible, so it would be remove the tumor if possible? Yeah, that's how that one was studied too. That one was studied. Um, they did it two ways. They did amputation followed by four rounds of chemotherapy and the vaccine. And then I believe at one point they were doing palliative radiation therapy and the vaccine because um, there's something called the abscopal effect that happens when uh, a patient is irradiated where there's all this inflammation that happens distantly from the tumor that's being irradiated. And there's some belief that it could be um, taken advantage of through immunotherapy. So they were trying to kind of um, promote and take advantage of the radiation side effects. So, um, but the trials, you know, they haven't been published. So, um, so I don't actually know when we're going to see those. So, you know, vaccines sound very sexy and everybody's very into them and they, you know, we want to hope that they're going to be out there and be very exciting. But even in human oncology, it's not really the way that everything's going. You know, if you watch TV and you see all these commercials, it's all these targeted therapies and all of this personalized medicine and mutational, you know, targeted small molecule inhibitors. So unfortunately, there's not tons of vaccines that are really making a huge difference. Right. Okay. Um, so I know you do a lot of other therapies. Um, so herbal diet thing, because so many things go into um, taking care of a, a pet that, that has a cancer diagnosis. Um, and there, you have a quote on your website, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I didn't write down the whole thing, but you want to concentrate on the soil the weed grows in, not the weed. And it, it can be very easy uh, when you're doing herbal medicine to turn your, 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 your herbal and food and all your support for the animal with cancer, it could be very easy to start saying, oh, I'm going to do uh, herbal chemotherapy. Basically, I'm attacking the tumor. And that's not really what we're doing. There's, it, it really is taking care of the whole. That's why it's called holistic medicine. So what things I, I know what I look at, but what things would you look at? Let's say a, a, somebody brought their dog in and they said, okay, well, he's got lymphoma um, and it's in the lymph nodes. Uh, where do we start, doc? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And thank you for asking this question because I think it's the hardest thing for pet parents to um, hear me say <laughs> because they come in and they want the cancer to go away and they're frantic and they're emotional and they don't want to hear me say, I can't fix it right now. It's going to take a while. Um, I'm treating your, your pet. I'm not treating lymphoma. <laughs> so um, yes, that's exactly okay. what it is. And I think the other thing that I completely didn't realize until I was further along in my career, because all of my conventional training made me think of it differently. When you think about treating cancer, you think about it like it's the enemy, like it's this foreign, you know, substance, this foreign thing that you need to wage a war against. And so you burn it with chemotherapy, you, you know, you poison it with chemotherapy, you burn it with radiation, you cut it out with surgery. You know, that's the conventional dogma of treating cancer. But what in reality cancer is, is it's our own cells that have gone rogue. They're not some outside invader that have come into, you know, our body, our animal's body and have, you know, attached themselves and they need to be cut out. Sometimes they do, and that's effective, but usually in the protocols that we're doing, what you're doing is you're trying to either build up a wall 
between you have to think of it like it's this naughty neighbor that's causing you you know distress and you just don't want it to keep you up at night <laughs> so you build up a wall so that it doesn't bother you when you sleep and that it kind of can do what it's going to do but it doesn't bother you or you slowly over time start to make it behave itself and come back to where it was before before it got out of control and usually what the goal is is to make it a chronic disease and to allow the patient to live with it chronically and not affect their quality or the quantity of life. In my opinion, the only cure for cancer is prevention of cancer, not getting it. Once you get it, in my opinion, what your goal is, is to make it a chronic disease that doesn't shorten your lifespan or affect you significantly. And so the first step when I get a patient is actually a lot of things because by the time that that animal has developed lymphoma, say like we were using as the example, although maybe something happened right beforehand, um, I'm sure you've seen this a million times, Judy, they just got a bunch of vaccines. Um, some, something they blew with some other disease or something, although maybe a couple things happened beforehand that led up to it. There's been many, many, many years of things that have been happening, inflammation, poor nutrition, obesity, chronic stress, um, over vaccination, over pesticide use, you know, whatever it is, environmental toxins, whatever that have led that patient to be where they are now. So the reality is that it's going to take a long time too. So the first thing that you do is you fix the things that are acutely life-threatening. So if there's something that is acutely going to cause them to pass away quickly, you, you fix that. And a lot of times that could be with conventional medicine, because if you need it to work fast, you need it to work fast. And then you just start slowly peeling back, peeling back the layers. So fixing the diet, fixing the inflammation, um, fixing the clinical symptoms, you know, and just like you said, you're not usually treating the tumor. You're usually treating the host because then secondarily it will be able to control this problem child. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. So it really is, it's multifaceted. Um, yeah. and sometimes that's, that's hard for, for people to grasp. I had a couple of not cancer cases, but people that came in with, you know, some pretty significant issues that I knew I could fix using alternative therapies might take a few weeks to get where we needed to be. And this one woman, I'll never forget, she looked at me and she said, I'm not here for the hocus pocus. I just want a drug to fix it. <laughs> I said, I think you're in the wrong place. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm like, I can give you a drug time. to fix it. So yeah. yeah. I can give you a drug. I can, I can give you a drug to get rid of the symptoms. I yes. can't fix it with the drug. I can get rid of the symptoms with the drug. Uh, if you want to actually fix the problem, we're going to go a different route. And she didn't really want to fix the problem. She just didn't want the dog doing what it was doing. So anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So uh, this, this is something near and dear to my heart. And I've asked a lot of oncologists this one, and I, I'm hoping your answer is not, not the one I usually get. So... <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so somebody brings their dog to you and it's undergoing therapy. Let's say it has cancer It's or cat. It can be anything. Um, I don't care if it's a ferret. Uh, they, they bring you this animal. It's got cancer. It's undergoing chemo, radiation, uh, herbal therapy, acupuncture, whatever. It's got all these things going on. And they come to you and they say, my primary veterinarian won't see my pet because it's due for a rabies vaccine. And in order to get in the office, I have to give a rabies vaccination. What do I do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> answer. So um, when I was at um, the Healthy Dog Expo pre-pandemic, so it was like, what, 2019? Yeah, a while ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jean Dodds was there yeah. and she was talking about her um, publicly funded trial that showed that in 80% of dogs, one rabies vaccine lasts eight years. Mm -hmm. And so I tell clients that, and then I tell them that there's something called titers that we can do. And that although they're not hundred percent, um, generally speaking, it is a piece of information that I can use to help guide my decision-making um, of whether this is really necessary or not, because in all of my cancer patients, it's very important 
to me that if I'm doing anything to stimulate the immune system, I know that it's absolutely necessary. And so we do a lot of titers in the practice. Um, titers, for anybody who is not aware of what they are, they measure antibodies, which is just one arm of the immune system. So it's not 100% accurate, which is what a lot of the criticism is about them on the conventional side. Um, I'm sure that anybody who listens to Judy, you've heard a lot about these kinds of things. So you probably know a lot more than the average person. Um, yeah. But I, we do tons of titers in the practice. They're not perfect, but I think that they're a good start. And I would tell you that, I don't know, we've probably, I can count on one hand how many patients have come back with an insufficient titer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Almost every oncologist I have asked has said, oh no, it's fine for them to get all their vaccines. We want, we want to keep them protected against all those diseases. Give them their vaccines. It's fine. When clearly the label on all vaccines says it's to be a healthy animal. Healthy animal. <laughs> yeah. Um, systemic cancer is not health in my opinion. But, well, that's, that's, you know, I kind of, that's where I fall from the tree, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Call me crazy. Uh, yeah. So while we're on that subject, how about heartworm, flea, and tick chemicals for an animal that is uh, struggling with cancer and its immune system is already being bombarded with a lot of things? What do, what yeah. do you do with that? I mean, uh, obviously different parts of the country might be a, a little different, but um, where do you try to steer a client with that? Yeah. I I'm lucky because obviously, as you know, we would get a period of time here in New Jersey where um, we would get a reprieve definitely from the mosquitoes, definitely from the fleas, the ticks to some point. But I, I follow what you tell people with the interceptor every six weeks. <laughs> I actually researched a lot of what you were telling people. And I was like, this makes a lot of sense when um, I was trying to change how I do things. Um, and so I, and this is the other thing too, which I'm sure that you have had the same experience, you know, owners ask a question and they want an answer and they want it to be black and white. And this is another one that's not black and white because mm -hmm. say the client could be backing up to a forest and have deer in their backyard. A client could be backing up to the ocean and have no issues with ticks, but lots of issues with fleas. Uh, a client could be a snowbird and have tons of risk of heartworm. So it is a very specific individual conversation. I do have clients that are completely all natural. Um, we make our own bug spray in house. I've had clients try it and they've given me feedback and they think it works. It's, you know, the essential oil stuff. There's all kinds of recipes out there. Um, and you know, I, myself with my senior dog, he's completely natural. Um, so it's an individual decision. I have some clients that they aren't comfortable doing the completely natural route. Maybe they have young children or they've gotten um, tick-borne diseases themselves, or maybe there's an immunocompromised person at home um, or someone who's pregnant or something like that. And then I have other clients that they're very committed and they're willing to. Um, and so it's, it's that balance of it's like everything with what we do with the holistic therapies. It's, you know, how much effort and energy are you willing to put in it to get a certain outcome? Right. Well, and I mean, that really is what the holistic um, medicine now, it's checks and balances, it's keeping your young balanced uh, and saying, okay, well, the risk is here. The benefit is here where where's that intersection that is yeah. going to be the most beneficial for for my pet so um i mean we've touched on it a little bit but if you uh if if somebody came to you so let's i'm gonna use a bernie's mountain dog as an example because they're like cancer central yeah. uh, i had one client she was on her fifth burner and she hadn't had one live past six years of age uh, they didn't even all have the same cancers but they all got cancers um, so if that client came to you and said, Hey, I'm getting another burner. And I know these guys are, uh, a bit of a challenge, uh, when it comes to cancer diagnoses or any breed, uh, what, what would be your recommendation from the get-go? Like, okay, I've ordered this eight week old puppy coming from this natural litter. What, what, how, how would you tell them to raise that, that pet in order to keep it as, uh, cancer-free as possible. I mean, genetics do play a role in some of these. So Yeah, they do. And it goes back a little bit to um, what you were saying earlier, which is um, the cancer risk in dogs and cats is basically on trend with that for people. But the big thing about people that causes the most cancer is smoking and alcohol consumption. 
two things that obviously our pets are not doing. And uh, but they so, could be living with second or third hand smoke. So they could be living with second or third hand smoke. So that is a possibility. Um, but there has to be something that contributes for the difference. Um, and I do wonder how much the breeding and the genetics has to do with it. Um, because that's something that obviously we can't deny about, especially certain breeds of dogs and things like that. Um, I imagine that because of the line breeding and the inbreeding that there probably are chromosomal abnormalities that are not beneficial for, um, minimizing certain diseases like really bad cancers. Um, but there is this thing called epigenetics, which means above the genetics. And <clears throat> there are a lot of people, and there's a lot of research going on about it, that believe that there are things that you can do to modify the genes that you have, you know, because you could, you could have a bad stock. But in humans, the research shows that only about five to 10%, some papers are way lower than that, are genetic cancers. Everything else is environmental. And when I found that out, that was like appalling to me. I had no idea that that many human cancers are all from lifestyle choices, not just because you were given a bad hand. And so <clears throat> um, I think that even before you order the eight week old puppy, I think that there's probably things happening that you should know about. So like, although I treat obviously a lot of cancer, um, I'll meet clients because I treat their dog with cancer and then they'll get a puppy and then they'll bring me their puppy. So I do do puppy consults sometimes. And I always ask them, what do you know about the breeder? How was the mother handled? Do you know how she was vaccinated? All those kinds of things, because we obviously know, and we are learning more and more about this in the human side, um, that the immune system, the microbiome, um, all of that of the fetus starts developing way before it's born. And so there's probably a lot of things that even happen before the puppy's born that can play a role. Um, but once they then are there and you take them and you know they're yours and you have full control over them i think that there's certain things that you know all holistic veterinarians will say are really important the number one thing is always diet it's a fresh food non-processed real food diet um you know whether that's raw whether that's you know not raw you know there's a, a, lots of different conversations but it's a non-processed diet um it's mindful vaccine schedule um you know, making sure not to just um, do it too many of them all at one time too quickly. There's those abbreviated mindful vaccine um, protocols. Um, and then the same with mindful use of the pesticides and, and basically just making sure that any, just like what you said, any risk that you're taking, you're sure that the risk is worth what you're doing. Um, the unfortunate reality is that I've had clients come to me that they have done everything right their entire life and it still happens. And then they feel like a failure. And so we know that there's certain animals and certain pets that are, this is going to happen to anyways. So in those instances, as they get older, doing certain blood work parameters that are non-traditional things like vitamin D status and C-reactive protein, which are, you know, non-traditional markers of immune system health and inflammation that may give some pictures. Um, there are some other functional blood work that certain holistic veterinarians can do where they look at things differently than just regular blood work. Okay. Um, early screening for cancers with x-rays and ultrasounds might be beneficial once an animal is a senior. Um, and then obviously immune supporting supplements, um, um, you know, um, cancer prevention supplements. Um, and then every animal has their own specific issues of their life. So you're going to want to support those in times of need. Um, so although there are certain things that can kind of be done as catch-alls, it really should be an individualized protocol because we know each one of them is an individual, just kind of like we are. What would be your top three supplements that you would recommend? Uh, 
more or less secure because uh, it's hard to get things in cats. Um, although a lot of these can be used in cats too, if you can get them in. Well, what would be your top three? If you said, hey, just across the board, I want, I'm going to keep this immune system in good shape. Here's what I'm going to give. Yeah. The most research for anti-cancer and cancer prevention is curcumin and turmeric. So for sure. Um, immune system modulatory um, medicinal mushrooms. And then from a nutraceutical perspective, vitamin C, I use vitamin C like all day, every day, all the time. I think that it's um, super important for so many things. Um, in lots of chronic diseases, it is um, deficient. Um, cancer is definitely deficient. Um, there are reasons to consider using high doses of it as a cancer prevention. Um, so I would say um, turmeric, mushrooms, and vitamin C. Okay, great. Uh, and then we had another question that was asked a couple of times. Um, lots and lots and lots of information out there right now or anecdotal stuff going around uh, using fenbendazole for cancer. I did have a couple of clients that uh, did find protocols and use it. And I gave them my blessing on it. I didn't prescribe it, but I gave them my blessing on it. And they did feel like it helped. Are you using it? I'm not. So there's a huge movement of repurposing drugs. Mm -hmm. So basically drugs that have been FDA approved for other things um, being repurposed and tried to use for cancer. So um, metformin is a very common um, drug to um, help control blood sugar and diabetes. They're investigating that for cancer. Fenbendazole, which is a, a veterinary dewormer, is being used to try for cancer. Um, what are some of the other ones we've heard about? Lodose naltrexone is a uh, pain medication being used for cancer. So there's this big movement to repurpose drugs to try to interfere with metabolic pathways, basically the ways that the cancer cells communicate with one another and um, uh, tell each other how to do things and the pathways that they talk to try to interfere with those. Um, and that's one of them. So just like with all of the holistic tools, one thing by itself is not going to get you the outcome that you want. Fenbendazole along with dietary changes and supplements and high dose C and mistletoe therapy and you know all these other things together might get you an outcome that you want. Um, so I just haven't, but um, I have had some clients that were interested and I did the same thing as you. I gave them my blessing, but it's not kind of like, on my priority list. Yeah, no, and it was used in combination with a lot of other things, yeah. but they wanted to add it in. And I said, well, I don't think it's going to hurt anything to yeah. add in. Uh, so now that you said the vitamin C thing, uh, people want to know how much and what, if you, so I've always uh, said that we needed to have a, a buffered vitamin C, but do you have a, a specific type of vitamin C or dosing of vitamin C that you use just as a, a routine preventive? So uh, vitamin C is, I saw someone made a comment about it, is water soluble. So that's true. So you can't overdose on it. So that's good. Um, so you're not going to give too much. Um, it's very safe. There's a very wide range for toxicity. Um, and when we do the intravenous vitamin C, the doses that you give are 100, 200, 300 times higher than you would orally. Um, in people, they've done studies and it seems that we probably only absorb about 500 milligrams at a time. So probably for a small animal, depending on the size of the animal, it's probably much smaller than that. Mm -hmm. So whether it's 250, 125, we're not really sure. Um, but after a certain gram amount, it's, we're not going to absorb any more of it. And so it's just a waste. So really when you're giving kind of the water soluble or the buffered kind, in order to get to those high gram doses, you probably have to give it two, three, four times a day because you can only give 250 to 500 milligrams at a time. Um, there are liposomal forms of vitamin C. So they're believed to be less irritating to the GI tract and slightly more bioavailable. That's what I take myself. Um, and that's what I give to my patients. It's this weird gel. Um, it doesn't taste very good, <laughs> but it doesn't give me an upset stomach and I can take more of it at a time. Um, the good news is that you can't hurt a patient on it. What you can do though, is if a patient is um, predisposed to getting calcium oxalate crystals, or um, they have a very acidic urine, you might not want to give them a ton because it could make things worse. Um, so um, generally what I tell owners to do is to find a product that you know, they trust a company that they like, talk with your veterinarian and dose by body weight um, because most animals just need prevention. It's in time of stress that you're gonna need much, much more. So, um, you know, exercise, chronic disease, cancer, um, immune deficiency, then at those times you can give 
five, 10, 15 times higher. Right. Okay. Um, I frankly, I could talk to you. We, I could have done all eight hours with you this weekend and we could have still not run out of things to talk about, uh, because yeah. you're a wealth of information the, here's the difference between somebody like Kendra versus me. Uh, Kendra loves scientific studies. <laughs> That's why she's a board certified oncologist. Cause she loves scientific studies. She loves papers. She loves to be able, she, first of all, her brain is like incredible. Um, and, oh. and she stores all that up there, which is amazing. Um, but she enjoys that stuff. Whereas me, I'm like, I go with the, you know, like what I see were, you know, just in actual day-to-day -day stuff. So I have, I have a few more years. So valuable and so helpful. <laughs> I have a few more years of, you know, <laughs> experience in the clinic. Yeah. Um, so a lot, but you know, unfortunately, uh, it's very difficult with anecdotal evidence to convince some uh, some doctors, some pet owners that no, I, I can make this work. I can this can help. Mm -hmm. um, so it it is amazing to have somebody like you who has that that brain that is just like this computer brain that just reads all that stuff and stores all that stuff, and it it's amazing. Um, and you're a wealth of information. You you gonna start writing books? I hope so. <laughs> I need to find time. I actually, clinical research is something that is so important to me because it's exactly what you're saying. You know, you see these things in clinical practice and you're like, there is something here. People need to know about this. This is real. This works. This is an option. Um, and so I, you know, I hope so. It's just, you know how it is in clinical practice. It's about like finding your footing to figure out where those opportunities to do other things are. So I'm going to have to ask you your advice on that. <laughs> I'll help you out with the, the book writing thing. Although uh, with your, your your credentials, you probably could get like Wiley Publishing or somebody behind you and you could actually have a publisher. Mine are all self-published, which has worked out wonderfully for me. Um, and it is not that difficult to do, but uh, I, I suspect that yours would be a lot more scientific back with, you know, lots of studies and stuff. All those papers um, that I geek out on. <laughs> yeah, all those papers that you geek out on, which everybody needs to, you know, we need those people like you because you can give us the, the facts. Um, just nothing but the facts. Uh, so, but this has been really <laughs> enjoyable. I am so grateful that you agreed to join us. Um, we do these about every six months. Uh, Gwen may be calling you again. Oh, awesome. <laughs> no, it's been so, it's been wonderful. It's been so easy. It's just like, we're just having a conversation. So thank you. It's, I, I, you're, you're very easy to interview, which is, uh, uh, you know, you're going to be very busy on the uh, speaking tour. <laughs> oh, thank you. But, uh, what I appreciate about you is you speak on the veterinary level, the professional level to professionals, helping other veterinarians learn about what you do, which is so important because there are very few people who do combine both sides like you do. Um, but you're also willing to talk to the clients and the pet owners. And we need more people who are willing to do that as well. So we appreciate you. Thank you so very, very much mm -hmm. for being with us. And for all of you who have signed up for this, you will be getting this recording in your inbox. So for all those notes that you missed, uh, you can go back and write them down and watch it 400 times. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, all right. You. Thank you very, very much. Bye, Bye. everyone. See you tomorrow. Bye.